Well, allegedly I'm live, um, if that is the case. Good evening. Um, just wanted to uh, make a couple of quick uh, announcements. One, um, I, I would just be in prayer for Ben. Um, he had a positive test, not able to be with us tonight, so we're kind of scrambling, trying to make things work. Um, and then two, I think for the foreseeable future, we will switch to just being online, um, which is partly because COVID and partly just because there's more people online than, than here. So I think we'll just go ahead and, at least for the time being, stay online only. Um, I did have a slideshow that I wanted to go with, go through with you guys, but I cannot make it work. I do not know how, and I'm, I'm not going to let it detract from our time. So we will do without. Um, tonight we will be talking about uh, persecution and martyrdom in the early church. Um, and I will just offer a forewarning, um, particularly when we talk about the martyrs. Um, the martyrs did not die tidy deaths. And so if these kind, if talking about accounts of martyrdom you think would make you squeamish, then I would, you know, mute it or turn away or just, or whatever makes you comfortable. But, um, yeah, I mean, the, the details are not, are not tidy. And so I just want you to be forewarned of that. So first we'll, we'll begin talking about persecution in the early church. Um, there are a lot of popular misconceptions about what persecution looked like in the early church. Um, two, the two biggest ones kind of going hand in hand being that persecution for the early church before Christianity was legalized was always empire-wide and always hyper-intense, um, which is not not accurate. Um, there were, in the whole history of the church before, from the, from the start of the church to the time it was legalized, uh, the religion was legalized, there weren't any more than three, maybe four times of widespread legalized persecution from the top um, against Christians imposed by the Roman emperors um, in the first 300 or so years of the church. But uh, in le less than 10 of those 300 years, um, when they were under organized persecution, were actually spent under organized persecution. But on the other hand, um, when you talk about the neighbors of the Christians, the people that lived in close contact with every day across the, the lands of the empire, um, we have record from, of localized persecution from basically every decade between 100 and 310 A.D. Um, so there was certainly persecution for our brothers and sisters in Christ, but it was not hyper-intense and it was not empire-wide for that entire time period. Um, so just so we have that clarified there. There were a number of reasons that the Romans persecuted the Christians as they did, uh, which we've talked about in our past couple of um, our past couple of sessions. Uh, you know the distinctiveness of the faith, all the things that made it so distinct from uh, the Roman world. You know, such as our non-retaliation and, and pacifism, um, the exclusivity of of Christ over and above the Roman gods, um, our very strict ethics, our moral and sexual ethics. Um, there was also just a general dislike among the populace across the empire for Christians because we were obstinate. We would not just do the easy thing and do the thing that would make everyone happy and just sacrifice in the name of the gods or the emperor. Um, and also part of, especially when you come to see the, the, ter the times of greater persecution, um, they largely came from emperors that had started in the army, um, and the army throughout the entire history of the Roman Empire was um, what you would traditionally consider uh, sort of a bastion or a, a sanctuary of traditional paganism. Um, and so these traditional pagans coming from the Roman army, whether that's you know people from um, Decius, uh, who was one of the great persecutors, to uh, people like um, Hadrian, uh, who was not as much of a great persecutor. Um, they were from, you know, these and many others were from the army. 
And those in the army, these traditional pagans, had no patience for the Christians and hated the Christians. Um, there was also just the fact that in the eyes of the Christians, the state was not the highest good. You know, part, that, was, that was perhaps more than any particular reason why the Christians irked the authorities so much is because in the Roman system, you know, be it religiously or economically or militarily, the state is the highest good. And to the Christians, that wasn't true. Um, that I would argue today that's still true for, for, for biblical Christians, that the state is not the highest good. But it certainly wasn't then, and so this, was, this, this combination of factors um, led, uh, if you remember Tertullian that we talked about last week, the church father, the apologist. Tertullian himself wrote, quote, They think the Christians the cause of every public disaster of every affliction with which the people are visited. If the Tiber rises as high as the city walls, if the Nile does not send its waters up over the fields, if the heavens give no rain, if there is an earthquake, if there is famine or pestilence, straight away the cry is, away with the Christians to the lions. Little do they know that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Of course, they are meaning that the church grows from persecution. Uh, for our purposes, there were really three great times of persecution. Uh, not, obviously not great, like it was a great time, but three times of truly intense, top-down persecution on Christians. Um, the first was under Nero. Um, the second, and that, and that was in 64 AD. The second was under the Emperor Decius, which was in 250. And then the last and the worst of the great persecutions was under Diocletian, and that was between 303 and 311. Um, so first we start with Nero. Uh, it's widely believed today, um, and it was widely believed even by the people of Rome at that time, that Nero, uh, when, 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 Rome, when Rome burned, when the fire of Rome happened, Nero did it on purpose so that he could clear part of the town or part of the city to make room for the expansion of his palace. Um, what he called the Domus Aurea, the Golden Palace. Um, and so rather than just really th think of something more clever, Nero played the politician and just shifted the blame to one group that everyone hated, and that was the Christians. And so um, Nero was merciless, absolutely bloodthirsty and merciless in his persecution of the Christians, even going so far as to bring captive Christians to his palace, have them crucified, and then douse them in oil and set them on fire to serve as torchlights for his parties. Um, when we come to Decius, and then this will also apply to Diocletian, who we'll talk about in a second, um, the, two, the biggest reasons why Decius and Dioc Diocletian were great persecutors of the church was because they felt the need to enact um, these edicts or these decrees that were designed to ensure the loyalty of the people. And so what they would do is they would make people um, of all, you know, all across the empire um, offer sacrifices both to the Roman gods and then to the emperor himself. And when you did this, you would receive a paper of certification saying you had done this so you'd be good to go. Well, obviously the Christians refused to do this. And so it made it very easy for the authorities to find them or catch them and then put them to death. Um, and they did so in droves under Decius and also under Diocletian. Uh, but as, as I said, the, the persecution under the emperor Diocletian was the bloodiest and most violent of all of the persecutions. And uh, in fact, you know, these three times of persecution, um, while they are, you know, often called the, the three great persecutions. This one in particular is often by itself, standalone, considered to be the great persecution. Um, and thousands, tens of thousands of Christians were, were martyred. But as bad as it was, it could have been so much worse. Diocletian came to power in 284 and he spent the first nine years or so of his reign um, venting his hatred of the Christians, 
not by persecuting them from the top down yet, but purging the army of Christians, and really anyone who wasn't a traditional pagan, but particularly Christians, and then surrounding himself with people that were staunchly opposed to Christianity. But nine years in, in 293, he came up with what turned out to be one of the worst ideas in the history of the Roman Empire. He decided to divide the power of the sole emperor into two separate emperors, one ruling in the east and then one ruling in the west, and then their respective successors that would come after them. And this was not a problem at first. Um, his own successor was Galerius, and Galerius hated the Christians just as much as Diocletian did. Uh, and it was actually Galerius who initially encouraged him to begin an empire-wide persecution. Uh, but it became a problem when Diocletian and his co-emperor Maximian retired as emperors uh, in 305 because their successors didn't equal, equally implement their ideas. Um, Galerius ramped up the persecution. He made it so much worse. But the successor of Maximian, the co-emperor, Constantius, who, if that sounds familiar, he's the father of Constantine, didn't really care so much about the persecution. He wasn't a Christian himself, but he wasn't really bothered by these Christians. And so, uh, as he ruled in the West, um, he generally chose not to enforce these loyalty and sacrifice edicts. Um, he just kind of let them be. And so, whether it was these two, Galerius and Constantius, or those that would come after them, um, the two emperors often disagreed, sometimes violently. It led to, to civil war, even. Uh, and that was a trend that would continue on for almost two decades until 324 when Constantine, who had replaced his father Constantius as emperor in the West, uh, came out on top after a series of civil wars between the East and the West. And it was Constantine who we know changed everything for the early church, but we'll talk about that probably next week. But all that to say, as badly as Diocletian persecuted the church, it would have been so much worse if he had remained the sole emperor and he and uh, he didn't have to contend with people not upholding his decrees universally. So we have these three great times of persecution, and then we have lesser times of persecution. Um, there were sporadic persecutions to a lesser degree under the emperors Domitian, Trajan, Hadrian, Marcus Aurelius, Septimius Severus, Maximinius and Valerian. Um, and by and large, the persecution under these emperors was sporadic and less intense because they didn't encourage the governors and the authorities to seek out the Christians. Um, instead, uh, and we see this in, in the letters and the writings of several of these emperors, uh, and also in, in secular Roman historians, when uh, a governor in a particular area would ask one of these, we'll use Marcus Aurelius for an example because he, in his own writings he mentions this. Uh, when a governor would ask the emperor, you know, hey, we've got these Christians, what do we do um, with them? What do we, what do we do to get rid of them? And the reply usually would be, well, don't go look for them, but if you find them and they refuse to recant, then execute them. Um, so definitely persecution. Um, at least somewhat from the top down, but not empire-wide and not hyper-intense, as I said. So what were some of the effects of these times of persecution, great or small? Uh, well, first, we truly, at that point, became a missional movement. We, were, we already, as a faith, were a missional movement, but we fled in all directions. From all parts of the empire, we fled in all directions, uh, running from the persecution, going into hiding, but also further advancing the gospel in all, all directions, truly at, at least more so than probably ever before going to the ends of the earth with him. Um, there was also a lot of discussion had um, between churches in various parts of the empire, but also just as the broader church, with what to do with those who had apostatized, those who had denied the faith by sacrificing the Roman gods and receiving their certificate of approval as a loyal Roman. Uh, and two really prominent groups came up during this time of debate. 
one of them, one group of them, was the Donatists. And the Donatists came from Carthage, and they believed that priests and bishops needed to be, in their words, blameless in order to administer the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which, logically, you couldn't claim to be if you denied the faith. Um, and so, naturally, this was highly contentious among the church in Carthage and in the broader church. And the Donatists were eventually declared heretics by the end of the 3rd century, or the 5th century, excuse me. Uh, the other group were the Miletians. Uh, the Miletians came from Egypt, around Alexandria, and they believed similarly to the Donatists, except their issue wasn't specifically with the clergy. It was with everyone in the churches who had apostatized and denied the faith. Uh, for the Miletians, anyone who had done this was anathema and could not be allowed to return to their churches. And the Miletians, at least to me, are more significant than the Donatists for two reasons. First, many of the bishops in the Miletian movement were supporters of Arius. And when Arius' best bud, Eusebius of Nicomedia, who we'll talk about in much greater detail when we talk about Constantine, um, when he encouraged them to revolt and go into schism against the established church, they happily jumped at him. And second, it was the Miletians and their schism um, who slandered Athanasius at the First Synod of Tyre in 335, during which they accused him of beating and even murdering Miletian bishops. And this ultimately led to his condemnation and his banishment and exile. Um, and then also Christians just began to meet more privately, uh, which seems logical. Uh, you know, whether that be at night or in, you know, hidden or unexpected places. Uh, the best example that we have archaeological or historical record for are the catacombs in Rome. Um, and these were large underground burial grounds dug by the Christians for their dead. Um, Ro Rome had put a ban for all people on burials within city limits, and so they dug these out of the rock outside the walls of Rome. And so in addition to just being large sort of almost mass graves for their, their dead, they also served as meeting places for nighttime worship. Um, and they also contain the best, bar none, the best surviving examples we have of Christian artwork before the 5th century. Um, there are enormous numbers of early Christian frescoes, mosaics, icons, iconographic works, um, enormous amounts. Um, with that, I think, I, we haven't been at it long, but I think we'll go ahead and just take a, a quick break. Um, ideally, I can figure out how to get our slides up. Uh, if not, either way, I'll see you back about, we'll call it, 
we're back now. Um, we, so we've talked about persecution and what that looked like and why it happened. And now we'll start to talk about what it really looked like, the, the nuts and bolts of it, as it were. And that comes out in martyrdom. Um, and what I kind of want to do is just read through some of the accounts of some notable martyrs, um, not necessarily dig into all of the context behind everything. Um, basically, all of the accounts that I'm reading you um, are either in books that are very easily accessible that I can recommend if you if you want me to, or you can, um, honestly, just Wikipedia would help you to find these um, if you decide to look into these on your own. Um, so we'll start with Stephen. Um, if you can remember Stephen in Acts chapter 7, um, he was stoned to death in Jerusalem. He gives this very passionate speech and, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the, the religious leaders and you know, sees Christ and then they, he's stoned to death. Um, he's traditionally considered to be the first of the Christian martyrs. Um, we have Polycarp of Smyrna. If you remember us talking about Polycarp last week and uh, how this, you know, this little 86-year-old man um, you know, stood before the crowd and um, ultimately he was burned at the stake um, under his own strength. He wasn't bound or anything. He just stood there and took it. Um, we also have Ignatius of Antioch, if you remember, another one of the early church fathers, the apostolic fathers. Sorry about that. Uh, we had a technical difficulty. Um, Ignatius of Antioch, uh, he was taken to Rome. We don't know why, if you remember uh, last week. We don't know why he was taken to Rome, but he was he was fed to the lions there in the arena. Not in the Colosseum, but there in an arena in Rome. Um, we have Cyprian of Carthage, if you remember us talking about Cyprian. Um, Cyprian has a very detailed transcript that still remains to this day of what his actual public trial went like. And he was very, very quiet, just kind of took the charges that were levied against him, refused to recant, and then at the end said, thanks be to God. And then he was um, taken outside Carthage and beheaded. Uh, we have St. Lawrence. St. Lawrence is a fascinating story to me because uh, he, he, was, he was there in Rome. He was a, uh, a servant in the Church of Rome. Um, and he had run afoul of the, the local authorities there. Um, they wanted him to turn over the treasury of the church there in Rome. And uh, he did his utmost to, as quickly as possible, get as much of the wealth of the church and the property of the church into the hands of the poor of Rome. And then when he was brought before the, the governor there um, and asked for his treasury, he came with the poor and said, these are the treasury. These are the treasures. And if you would like, I can throw in our pearls, those being the pure virgins of Christ. Well, needless to say, this greatly angered the authorities. And so they were so angered that they decided to heat up a large griddle, uh, is the best way to describe it, and then burn him on it. Um, and uh, Lawrence in just a pure moment of, of unintentional comedy. He is laid back first on the griddle, which is not the funny part. I shouldn't have phrased that that way. He's laid back first on the griddle and is there until his, his flesh is black. And the account tells us that Lawrence said, and I quote, I'm done on this side. Turn me over now. Um, so just r remarkable humor in such a moment. Uh, we have the martyrs of Lyon and Vienne. Um, these were 48 Christians from uh, what was at the time Lugdunum, which was Lyon, and Vienna, which is not Vienna, Austria. It's now called Vienne, both in France. And they were brought to the amphitheater there in Lyon, um, and all were eventually put to death by various means. Um, the most notable of these were Pothinus. Pothinus was the very first bishop in all of Gaul, which is modern France. Um, he was 90 years old, and he was uh, brutally scourged, whipped, um, and beaten, and he died in prison. 
Um, and then Blandina, a slave girl, who we'll talk about her in a moment, but she's one of the more notable ones. Uh, and if you remember us talking last week about um, the early church father, the apostolic father, or the early church father, Irenaeus of Lyon. Um, Irenaeus was sent by Pothinus to Rome before this took place with a letter for the bishop of Rome there um, denouncing this new heresy of, of Montanism that was popping up at the time. And so he escaped the persecution, and that's why he became the second bishop of Lyon, because Pothinus perished. Uh, we have Perpetua and Felicity, or Felicitas, if you use the Latin. Perpetua was a 22-year-old noblewoman, um, and Felicity was her slave. I'm not sure of her age, but she was her slave. Both of them were pregnant when they were brought to be martyred, um, and Perpetua had already had a child that we sh she was still nursing. Um, and, and in fact, Felicity would go on to give birth in prison, awaiting her execution, um, and entrust her child, her little girl, to a, a sister in Christ who would raise her as her own. And uh, Felicity wanted to accept her fate, accept her glorious fate with her mistress, Perpetua. Um, both of them were living in Car Carthage. They were arrested, arrested and taken to be put to death in the arena there. Um, and in what was for the Romans at the time a fit of irony, um, they were gored to death by a cow, a regular cow. And that's ironic because, you know, in the arena, they, you know, you face lions or, or tigers or even, you know, bulls. But the authorities selectively, like, like deliberately picked a cow almost to make fun of Perpetua and Felicity for not just sticking in their traditional motherly course as Roman mothers. We also have Catherine of Alexandria. Catherine of Alexandria was a 17-year-old girl. She was the daughter of the governor of Alexandria at the time. Uh, she became a Christian at 14 and was actually, by her own writing and the record were given of her, uh, very scholarly and quite an apologist as well. Uh, in fact, the story goes that the reason for her arrest in the first place was that um, when uh, the emperor at the time began to sort of persecute Christians, uh, some Christians across the empire, uh, Catherine, Catherine publicly called him out on it. And so rather than, for whatever reason, rather than just immediately have her put to death, the emperor uh, brought together 50 of what he considered to be his most gifted orators and philosophers to try to refute the claims that she was making about Christ. And she won the debate against all 50, to the point where many of them converted. Uh, although those who, who did convert were executed on the spot. Um, as for Catherine, she was scourged. Uh, she w underwent the breaking wheel, which the breaking wheel... Um, from antiquity through the Middle Ages was a immensely heavy iron-bound wagon wheel that was dropped on those it was used on to break bones and, and smash organs, uh, but not, not to kill them. Um, killing would come after several, several uses of this, um, initially just to torture them. Um, her breasts were also torn off, and ultimately she was beheaded because of her opposition to the, uh, to the emperor there. We have Agnes. Agnes was the 13-year-old daughter of a noble family in Rome. Um, she, at the outset of her, com her commitment to faith in Christ, committed herself to a lifetime of virginity, being a bride of Christ, as they were called in that time. And after many suitors had come to try to you know, woo her and court her, and she had rebuffed all of them, uh, one of them reported her to the authorities as a Christian. And so she ended up being dragged naked through the streets, actually brought to a, a brothel for them to try to, for, to her, for the authorities to offer her up to, for people to have her way with them. Um, and she was then from there tortured and, and beheaded in Rome. Uh, and then we have Blandina, who I mentioned previously. 
And Blandine, as I said, was a slave girl. Um, she was part of the martyrs in Lyon of Vienne. And Blandina was tortured worse than any of those, uh, any of those 48. And in so many different ways, this, the tradition tells us, that the authorities eventually almost gave up and almost let her go because they ran out of ways to torture her. Um, but after they had finished torturing her, she was first tied to a stake in the town arena, and then uh, lions were set upon her, unleashed on her. Um, but the lions wouldn't go near her. Uh, then they tried tigers, then they tried bulls, tried bears. None of them would go near her. And then eventually she was taken down from the stake um, and then tossed on top of a bull who then gored her to death. And as I said at the outset, these are not, they didn't die tidy deaths. Um, they died brutal deaths at the hands of the pagans. But they went joyfully. Um, the account of Blandina that we're given, uh, for example, tells us that the strength of her prayer as she was tied to the stake awaiting the lions was so great that it encouraged all of those other 48 or 47 who were with her to be all the bolder in pro proclaiming Christ as they were even as even as they were being killed um, I also think that it's significant that so many stories of the martyrs were that of women and girls um, oftentimes especially the most holy ones I, I suppose as the Roman church would call them in their calendar of saints uh, were virgins uh, a big deal was made of their virginity and how extra holy that was um, but to me it's particularly notable because I think it just shows how the church valued her daughters um, we didn't just you know, the church didn't just take her take her her daughters you know her mothers and, and daughters um, and then just confine them to a household role and keep them away from danger they encouraged them the same way they encouraged everyone else, rich or poor, male or female. And it was because of their faith, their bold faith, their unashamed faith, that they went to death in the first place. We also see a relation, at least I see a relation, um, to these accounts of the martyrs um, with the later traditions that we see in the Roman church of the veneration of the saints and the holy relics. And I want to read a quote to you from a book by Nicholas Needham, um, part of a series called 2,000 Years of Christ's Power. And he addresses this, this link to the veneration of the saints and the holy relics. He writes, quote, Along with the growth of ritual and ceremony in 4th century church practice and worship was the expansion of the cults, quote-unquote, or religious honorings of the saints and the relics. Christians attached an ever greater importance to the dead bodies of those who had been considered outstandingly holy in their lifetimes, especially martyrs. Chapels and shrines, and sometimes churches, were built over the tombs of saints. Uh, some good examples of these actually are the Church of the Holy Sepul Sepulchre in Jerusalem, which is built on top of, or was originally, there, there was a building before and now there's a newer building. Uh, was originally built on the site of what is believed to be where Jesus was both crucified and then buried. Uh, and then also the old and the new versions of St. Peter's Basilica in the, in the Vatican, which is built on what is believed to be the tomb of Peter. Believers increasingly prized relics of saints, things that had belonged to the saint when they were alive, like a piece of clothing or even one of their bones. The idea developed, which had already been present in seed form since the earliest times, that the dead saint now in heaven could help struggling believers on earth by their prayers. After all, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much, which James tells us in James 5. Surely then a saint's prayers would be even more effective now that they were in heaven. So then the Christians practiced not praying to the saints, but asking the saints in heaven to pray for them. This was called invocation, or invoking the saints. In popular piety, it often drifted into a custom of actually praying to the saints, 
which was little different from the way the pagans had prayed to their various gods. People considered particular saints to be especially good at meeting particular needs. One could bring about a cure for childlessness, another could protect travelers, another could reveal the future, etc. This gave rise to patron saints, as we know them today. Saints who took special care of particular groups of groups or types of people. Um, some of the better examples on that kind of spectrum go from Paul, who was the patron saint of missionaries, evangelists, and theologians, all the way to St. Lawrence. Uh, if you remember, as I said, St. Lawrence was, was essentially grilled to death. And he is the patron saint of cooks, chefs, and comedians. So there's quite a spectrum of patron saints that are all representing a variety of different things. And while many of the early church fathers, uh, some that he lists include Ambrose, Augustine, John Chrysostom, and Jerome, to name a few, encouraged this practice, others saw what was going on uh, under the surface, uh, how things appeared on the surface. One of these people was a French presbyter named Vigilantius, who wrote about what he saw as Christians lapsing into pagan customs and practices. And Vigilantius wrote, Disguised as piety, we virtually see the worship of the pagans being introduced into the churches. People light rows of candles in broad daylight, and everywhere they kiss and adore a dead body's dust, deposited in a little pot and wrapped in a precious cloth. So as I said, you see this, you see this tying into... Uh, the Roman Catholic Church now. Um, but at the time, these things were not, at least by some, seen as bad things. Um, you know, it, The martyrs were a first order in terms of those who were especially holy and praiseworthy, uh, both in their lives and especially now in their death. Um, but as, we, as with so many things in the history of the church, and really just the history of humankind, what started out as at least a, an ambivalent thing, if not a good thing, in relatively short order turned into a bad thing. Um, as, he, as they even saw in that time, that early, people began to pray to the saints. Um, we see this lend itself, uh, as another example, lending into why people pray to Mary. You know, Aside from just the fact that she has been in the Catholic tradition, elevated to co-redemptrix with Christ, or co-redeemer, um, and you pray to Mary, who will take it to Jesus, who will take it to God, because Mary is a mother and understands us better than Jesus can. Um, you pray to her. You don't pray and then hope that she'll pray for you. You pray to her. Um, and and this, these traditions definitely lent themselves to that. And then relics in particular... Um, again, starting out, maybe not a, a, a great thing, maybe kind of a weird thing, even at the beginning, but it would morph so quickly into such unhealthy things. And by the time, actually, of Martin Luther and the Reformation, um, because relics um, had been at that time linked to purgatory and the notion that if you owned a relic, depending on the saint that it came from, it would remove this many years you would have to spend in purgatory. Uh, at one point, the, uh, the benefactor of Martin Luther, uh, who was a uh, elector or a, uh, a, a sort of a noble person there in the Holy Roman Empire, was of such wealth and status that at one point he owned enough relics to... Uh, remove from himself over three million years worth of time in purgatory. Um, it became a, a, a thing for nobles to do, to collect relics. Um, so relics are a little weirder, uh, even from the beginning, and obviously became a very unhealthy thing as they are today. Uh, and, and that's not obviously exclusive to the Catholics. The Orthodox venerate relics. Um, the Eastern churches... Uh, which is not like the Far East. That's, that means like the, the Syrian churches and the, the Coptic churches venerate relics of the saints. Uh, it's really just Protestants that don't do that. Um, but then veneration of the saints, the initial idea of that does not sound terrible. 
so to speak. Um, it sounds to at least some degree somewhat believable. Uh, you know, they were so holy in life or outstandingly good or, or righteous in life that maybe we can petition them and hope that their prayer will, will be more effective in the eyes of God. I'm not saying I agree with it or that we should agree with it, but it at least makes a little more sense than the practice of the relics. But it too, as with the relics, became a very unhealthy thing to where, as Vigilantius wrote, even then in the third century when he wrote that, uh, we started to worship as the pagans, essentially, in doing that. And you still see these practices in churches that venerate the saints today. Uh, as I said, the, Ro the Roman church has a calendar of saints, and virtually no day passes during the year where a saint does not have their particular day, whether they're a patron saint or not. Uh, there's something, there's well over a thousand saints, if I remember right. Um, but all those things to say, you know, aside from the fact that you can see these traditions in the early church, I think the big takeaway take from looking into the persecution of the church and, and what happened to the martyrs and some of the most notable examples of the martyrs is that um, they had a joy in Christ and a peace about their fate that is basically alien in the West today. Um, I, I, can, I can remember when ISIS first became a thing and there were accounts of them beheading Christians in the, in the, on the beach in Egypt. They, I, I'm sure at least some of them, knew what was going to happen, knew who they were dying for, knew the hope that was within them, and were joyful, or at least calm and accepting of their fate. We have no idea what that looks like. You know, yes, we're in a great state of division and turmoil in this country, um, arguably worse than perhaps ever before. That is really inarguable, inarguable that that's the case. But we don't really see persecution like that. We don't really know what to do with that. Uh, if missionaries come back from persecuted countries and they talk about what's happened to the people there, you know, we, we can at, le you know, at least at times tend to have this sort of, oh my gosh, that's so horrible, I don't want to think about that attitude with it. Uh, and this, is, this isn't meant to be a critique, it's, it's just as true of me as it is of anyone else that uh, thinking these things. But I, I think that we can look at the lives of the martyrs and those that were persecuted uh, during this time when the faith was still illegal and really be encouraged and emboldened by their example. I mean, you know, if you remember Agnes, um, another one that I didn't mention was Lucy. Lucy was 12 years old. She died in a similar way to how Agnes did. Um, many young people dying for the faith. Uh, women and men, old and young, um, joyfully accepting their fate uh, because of the, the crown of glory, as they saw it, that they were to receive. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned with Perpetua and Felicity, Felicity gave birth in prison and then still went to her death. You know, under Roman law at that time, pregnant women couldn't be executed. So she had an out. But she was legitimately, at least according to the account that we're given of, of the two of them, she was legitimately anxious that giving birth would prevent her from going to her fate with her mistress perpetual. That's beyond radical. We have no concept of that today. Um, and, and to at least some degree, that's a good thing. I mean, we're we're in great confines in a great country that allows us to enjoy a lot of freedom in terms of how the church operates and, and professes its beliefs, and that's, that's awesome. And the, the West in general, while it is, is more secular and becoming more secular, still has these freedoms. But we have no understanding of this. Um, it's just not a thing we've really ever seen unless we've been on the mission field or we've seen some kind of video of these things happening or detailing these things. So I, I think, again, the, the big takeaway from looking at the persecutions, the times of persecution uh, and the martyrs, is that 
you know, beyond just saying things like, well, God is in control. It's important to really believe that. Because it's one thing to say God is in control almost the same way you would say, well, it is what it is, and just kind of accept that you, you can't fix anything and just try to deal with it. But it's another thing to say God is in control and rejoice in that because you can know that because of this hope that you now have in Christ, you do not have to fear anything. You do not have to be afraid to go and share your faith. Yes, on the surface, if you work in a job where that's kind of a sticking point or a problem, or even if you work in a job where you could see action against you, those are terrible things. But you do not have to fear evangelism. You do not have to fear sharing the news that through Christ we have access to the Father and can have an actual eternal life that is not in condemnation. There's no reason not to share this news. Um, We can be fearless in missions. We can be fearless in service. We can be fearless in so many things that we take for granted in the church for the same reasons that they were fearless because they had the same strong Christ to sustain them as we do today. So we'll kind of wrap it here, uh, just to kind of preview for next week. We will almost, I don't say almost certainly, but more than likely spend our entire time talking about Constantine, um, primarily because Constantine is such a both important figure in the history of the church and also a polarizing figure in the history of the church. We'll talk about Uh, his conversion, uh, or at least his alleged conversion, depending on who you ask. Um, The events that led to the Council of Nicaea, the first big ecumenical church-wide council that he called into into order. Um, Some of the misconceptions about Constantine, you know, like Constantine made up the New Testament at Nicaea, uh, being one of them. And then we'll also talk about some of the more controversial things about him. Um, in particular, was he really a Christian? Um, and just kind of examining the surroundings around that and you know his, his deathbed baptism and things like that. So we'll spend our, our time talking about Constantine and fleshing out why he is so important and, both, and also so polarizing in the history of the church. But until that time, um, God bless. Go in peace. <laughs>